What's up folks, David from DoD Media, and today I'm gonna to be showing you how you can achieve the Brenizer effect with your camera. And I'm holding my camera so I can't do my clap, so bah! Okay, so the Brenizer effect, what is it? Uh, it's named after Ryan Brenizer, who's a photographer, and actually, I mean, he kind of self-titled it that. This is a really old technique. He didn't invent it. He basically just acquired it and splashed his name on it. But nonetheless, worldwide now, it is known as the Brenizer effect, or the Brenizer effect, or the Brenizer effect, or the Brenizer method. Mm. Whatever you want to call it, it basically involves taking a load of photos on your camera, all using the same focal plane, the same focal distance. So you focus on the subject once, and then you just fire off a ton of shots. Uh, I mean, I tend to do about 40 shots for this to work really well. And the result is this kind of large format film depth of field that you just, you cannot get with a DSLR with a 35 millimeter sensor, regardless of what lens you're using. It's, it's like you've got this ultra wide, super fast, like 0.0, .0 you know, f-stomp, it's, it's just nuts. You just have to kind of see it to, to feel it. And so I've got a friend of mine at the moment who's very pregnant and I thought she could be a good subject for this. Do a little Brenizer pregnancy shoot. This is my buddy Zoe. She's pregnant. <laughs> when are you ready to pop? Uh, 8th of December. 8th of December. Yeah, so four weeks. Not long now. No. Scary. Okay, so basically what you need to do is make sure you have everything in manual. So that's exposure, that's ISO, that's your shutter speed, your aperture, uh, even your white balance. You wanna make sure that that's all uh, manual so it's not gonna shift because I'm gonna be pointing the lens at brighter areas, darker areas. You don't want your camera to start adjusting the exposure on you because it's gonna make it a lot harder in post-production. So when you're ready, just fire away like 40 shots and start with your subject because it's always a little bit easier to do it that way. Uh, that way they can move and it won't matter because you're focusing on the surrounding shots after that. There. Awesome. All right, and now we basically dump all of these in Lightroom. Let's just quickly get these photos into Lightroom. I'm just gonna choose add because I don't wanna move them from where they are. I'm quite happy with where they are. I just wanna add them to the catalog. So they're all selected, hit import and bam. Okay, now hit D on the keyboard. It'll bring you to your develop module. And there is Zoe holding the bump. Perfect, that's the first shot that I wanna start working on because it's the central shot and I want everything else to look good in relation to that shot. So I'm just gonna drop the highlights there, I'm gonna bring the shadows up to about there. I'm gonna give it a boost of clarity, like 30. And I'm going to give it a touch more contrast, say 15. And then I'm gonna head down to the tone curve. I'm gonna give it just a little bit of an older fashioned tone curving, like that. All of this is easier to do in Photoshop later. This is literally just an adjustment to be able to have, you know, everything uh, aligned so that all the photos have the same look. Okay, very important here, you enable profile corrections. The reason you do this is it gets rid of some of the distortion that happens on your lens. So unless you're shooting say 70 millimeters on a full frame camera, um, you're gonna get some distortion because it's just not a one-to-one -one representation of what the eye sees. You're gonna get some uh, vignetting as well, so it'll get rid of that vignetting so that when you stitch all these photos together, you don't see these weird black edges cropping up around the place. All right, so anyway, enable profile corrections. It recognizes the lens, so that's perfect. It's done exactly what it needs to do. Great. Now I'm just gonna hit Control or Command A, which will select all of my photos. Hit Sync, and I'll just check all because everything is manual, so everything should be exactly the same. And synchronize. Bam, bam, bam. Now if I head along and just have a quick look, you can see, okay, the sky is blown out, but so be it. It was just a, a bright sky. Not much I could do about that. And that all looks good. Yeah, cool. All right, 
Okay, so there's a few ways that you can do this from here on. Um, you could export all of these as JPEGs or TIFFs if you wanted, or DNGs, I guess, and then import all of those files as a bunch, as a batch, into Photoshop um, in the Photo Merge tool. Or you could just do it straight from Lightroom. You could send them to Photoshop and edit in Merge to Panorama in Photoshop. Or the version that I prefer even better is just to do it straight in Lightroom. You go Photo Merge Panorama. It'll load up this panel and it takes a little while, but actually having done it all of those different ways, this is by far the fastest method to get your panorama. And actually Lightroom is really good at fixing all the little issues um, in, you know, slight differences in, in exposure time from, you know, I guess from even the, the shutter or the mirror dropping at a slightly different speed. I prefer just going straight through Lightroom. Uh, it may be that your computer just can't handle that because Lightroom is not the smartest uh, piece of software when it comes to using your computer's resources properly. So if that's the case, uh, try this in Photoshop. You'll see it's it's just a lot um, less intensive, but it takes a lot more time. So you just have to kind of let Lightroom do its calculations. It'll take a little while, but you know, it is crunching down 40, 50 odd, 51 in fact, photos, which are all about 20 megapixels and they're all raw. So this thing is, is gonna be huge. This, this resulting picture is gonna be enormous. And there we go. It's calculated it, looks fantastic. This is just a preview. It hasn't actually crunched down everything yet. But even here, you can just really see that, you know, that fantastic separation between her and the background and the foreground. It's like, it's, it's not something you can get with a DSLR. It's just, it's fantastic. So when you're happy, uh, I'm going to go with a spherical, sure, why not, um, auto crop. I don't want to do auto crop because I'm actually going to be doing a little bit of Photoshop to this afterwards. So I'm just going to hit merge. And now it's going to add the photo merge to the tasks. And if you click up here, you can see how it's doing with that task. And you can see it's just working its way along nicely. And here is the resulting stitch. This looks amazing. And you can zoom in and just look at that. Oh, beautiful. Fantastic. Look at that bokeh. Lovely. Look at all that aberration. Isn't that wonderful? And all of that is 18,566 by 11,595. That, folks, is a 215 megapixel picture. Wow. Okay, so now that that's done, I'm gonna come back up and do a little bit more of the editing here. Um, I just wanna do a tiny bit of brush correction. So I'm just gonna increase the exposure here by a tiny bit, say 35, 0.35, and just have that on Zoe in the center. And then I'm just gonna decrease the overall exposure a little bit more. And then I'll just bump up that middle exposure again. It just helps with the kind of, you know, the centering of the shot that, that you really just draw the focus in on your subject. It's just a nice way to do that. Okay, and now we're just gonna send this to Photoshop so that we can stitch out all of this and fill it up as much as we can to try and keep as much of that resolution as we can. So just hit Control or Command E. And again, it may take a little while to load this up because it's a 200 plus megapixel photo. I just can't get over that. It's so enormous. Okay, so there's a few things we can do straight away. Uh, first thing is hit Control T and it's gonna bring up your transform tool and then come up here to where there's the, uh, the warp mode, the, the free transform. Okay, and we're just gonna drag these corners out a little bit just so that they move past that transparency zone. Because actually, even though it looks like we're distorting it a lot here, it's not something you'll notice in the slightest once the photo is, is you know, finished. You just, you won't notice that distortion at all. No one else will anyway. Okay, drag that along there, that's good. I'm just gonna drag this up a tiny bit because it looks like that line is bending a bit. All right, and then the sky as well. And up 
there and there and this bit we're going to try and fill in but I guess I can just stretch it a little bit out make the filling in process a little easier okay and I think that's pretty good in this part we're just going to have to content aware fill all right so hit enter and that'll apply those changes all right, next thing, you're gonna hit your lasso tool, so L on the keyboard. It's gonna bring up your lasso here. And this is where we're gonna be content aware filling, right? So just lasso along here. The reason I don't use a, a marquee is just having a straight line makes it more noticeable that it's been filled. Having the lasso as a kind of free drawn thing, there's more human error. And so you actually notice it less when it's being content aware filled, I think anyway. So next, hit shift and backspace once your selection ants are marching, and it's gonna bring up your fill panel. Make sure content aware is selected there. Hit color adaptation, and make sure you uncheck preserve transparency because we're actually filling in transparency here. So if that's ticked, it's gonna say, okay, well that's transparent, so I'm not gonna touch it. So we don't want that ticked because we do wanna fill in the transparency. So hit okay. And there we go, Photoshop's filled it in for us. Let's see if it's any good. Yeah, it's not too bad actually. I think that's doable, that's workable. I might just uh, zoom in a little bit here. Hit J on the keyboard to bring up the patch tool. I'm just gonna patch a few bits here which look a little strange. Not that you would ever notice this, to be honest. Um, you know, if you were just looking at the full size print. Now you can see there's a bit of a transparent edge that's left there. And it's hard to tell sometimes if that's just a glitch in Photoshop or if it's actually a, a pixel that is, you know, remaining there. But just to be safe, we're going to hit Control T again and just drag it out the tiniest amount, just the tiniest, tiniest amount. And that way it will get rid of that tiny bit of transparent edge. There we go. Lovely. OK, so that corner is done. Let it do its thing. And then we're going to move down to the lower corner. So then the same thing here, we're just going to select all along here da -da -da -da, and hit shift backspace, content aware, uncheck preserve transparency, OK, let it work its magic. Boom, there we go. Now it's filled it in nicely. The problem is it's using parts that are sharper in an area that should be shallower, it should be more blurry. So we're going to have to do a little bit of patchwork here. Now that we've done the, the fill, we're gonna have to patch it because that just, that looks weird. So if you just keep your selection held there, hit J on your keyboard again to bring up the patch tool and just drag this selection along to say there. That's gonna push that blur all the way across there. Now it's doing something weird here again so you know what and these leaves look a little strange so you know what let's just select all of this down to there and let's just bring it over to let's bring it over to like there yeah that looks pretty good a little bit more blending that needs to happen here i think and then it's good where haven't we used try that. Cool. Let me just get rid of this patch here because this patch and that patch seem to be similar or at least they look a bit too similar for my liking. Okay, that looks pretty good to me. Again, you can see that tiny line of transparency there. So we're going to hit Control T again. We're going to come back up to the mesh and just drag that down a touch. Literally just a touch. It doesn't need to be much. I'm rhyming now. Okay, there we go and that corner out a tiny bit. Perfect. Okay, and when you're happy, just hit Control Save, Control S, or you can go up to File, Save, and it's actually, you don't need to save it as anything because Lightroom has already turned this into a file to send to Photoshop. So if you just head back to Photoshop, you'll see there, one of two, that is the file that you sent to Photoshop, and it's come back with all of its changes now, with all of its edits. Perfect. So now you can continue treating it if you want to treat it. I'm going to use a little preset that I made over here 
called Fashion Thing, and that's pretty cool. I like that. You can get this preset bundle on my Selfie store. Uh, link is in the description. And there you go. When you're ready, you can hit export, and you've got yourself a 200 plus megapixel Brenizer Method beautiful picture. Bam. There you go. You're a Brenizer Method master. Fantastic. If you liked what you saw, give this a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, leave a comment in the comment section, and I'll see you in the next video. Happy Brenizering. <laughs>